out a connection card. For every first time guest that we have fill out a connection card, we are gonna donate $5 to reach the Forgotten Jail Ministry. So they are a statewide organization and we are partnered up with a local chapter and they are helping those who are currently incarcerated as well as those who have recently been released. So make sure you stop over after service and say hello. If it's your second time, you can also head over there. We have a $5 gift card to Boomerang Coffee waiting for you. Just as a thanks for coming back and spending some time with us. While you're over at the connection counter, you can also pick up a little date card for our summer agape nights. We're going to have four more of those. We had our first one last night of food, fellowship, and fun. It was an awesome time. So you can check out the dates for the rest of the summer on those guys. And you can also pick up an empty baby bottle. So today through Father's Day, we are participating in a baby bottle campaign with Life Clinic Community Resources. So you can take home an empty baby bottle, fill it with cash, check, coins, whatever you got laying around, um, and it'll help support things like medical care, parenting classes, and even trauma support. So make sure you're grabbing one of those and taking it home. Sunday, May 29th, which is next week, we are having our new to Axiom class directly after the 9 o'clock, nope, not, a, not after the 9, after the 11 o'clock service. So May 29th, that's next week. It's going to be about 30 minutes long. If you're interested in learning a little bit more about our church, our vision, and get a chance to meet our staff, we would love for you to join us for that. If you're interested in giving to Axiom today, there's a couple of different ways you can do that. You can head over to our website at axiom.church and hit the Give Now button. You can give right here in person in the back of the sanctuary, or you can download our free Tithely app. The band is going to join us on stage and lead us in a time of worship. I invite you now to bow your heads and close your eyes as we pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your presence today. Lord, we are so grateful that you know everything about us. Lord, today help us run to you first before we seek help from anything or anyone else. You alone are our source of strength. You alone have everything that we need. So here we are, Lord, professing that we need your help. We pray these things in the name of Jesus. Amen. Well, good morning, church. Let's stand up on our feet together. Who's ready to praise our Father? And we're going to offer everything that we have together because He is worthy of that praise. So together, let's lift this with everything we have. Well, I searched the world, but it couldn't fill me. Well, man's empty bricks, treasures that fade. Never enough that you came along and yeah. put me back together, and every desire is now satisfied here in your love. All right, let's declare this now. Oh, there's nothing. There's nothing better than you, Lord. There's nothing, nothing is better than you. Yeah. Well, I'm not afraid to show you my weakness. Lord, you've seen them all, and you still call me friend. Cause the God of the mountain yeah, is the God of the valley. And there's not a place your mercy and grace won't find me again. Lord, there's 
good. All right, then we're going to declare this in this space. Declare the glory of our Father. We're going to speak this over the enemy. You turn mourning to dancing. You turn mourning to dancing. You give beauty for ashes. You turn shame into glory. You're the only one who can. You turn mourning to dancing. You give beauty for ashes. You turn shame into glory. You're the only one who cares. You turn grace into garden. You turn bones into army. You turn seas into hours. You're the Because of his power, he is worthy of praise. Worshiping him because he is Lord. So we're going to let our praise continue. We're going to lift this up. And as we lift this song, let's make this our prayer. That we will draw closer to the Lord. That we will love like Him. That we will see like Him. That we will see Him in everything. Because He is all around us. His hands are outstretched towards us. He is here in this room right now. Let's soften our hearts. Let's make ourselves more aware of his presence as our praise continues. As we lift this together this morning. Beautiful and 
Jesus Christ, my King, robed in majesty, enthroned above everything. So let my praise be more than music. Let my prayers be more than words. I want to give you all I have. I want to know you, want to live for you, can you bring me closer, can you bring me closer, I want to hear you, I want to feel you, can you bring me closer, can you bring me closer. Draw us closer, Jesus. Dry the sea and shelter me. I'm held as the storm comes passing by. Heaven sent to rescue me. I cry out to God. I want to know you, want to live for you, can you bring me closer, can you bring me closer, I want to hear you, I want to feel you, can you bring me closer, can you bring me closer. I just invite you to close your eyes and bow your heads with me for a moment. Dear Lord, as we offer up our praise, Father, this is what we are seeking. Lord, we are seeking to grow in faith, to grow in your name, Father. Lord, open our eyes to the blessings that you give us that we don't deserve. Father, every morning that we wake up with the breath of life in our lungs, let us offer praise to you. Let us continue growing in your name. Father, you are all that we are seeking, and we will praise you this morning. Amen. So fix my eyes. Fix my eyes upon your goodness and your glory and help me to grow. Help me to grow. Cause in the midst of this fallen world, you were all that I long to know. That I long to know. Fix my eyes upon your goodness and your glory and help me to grow, help me to grow. In the midst of this fallen world, you were all that I long to know, that I long to know. Move in this space and move on. Oh, 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 I want to feel you. Can you bring me closer? Can you bring me closer? I want to know you. want to live for you. Can you bring me closer? 
Can you bring me closer? I want to hear you. I want to feel you. Can you bring me closer? Can you bring me closer? Let us grow every day. Let our hearts be like the heart of Jesus. He alone has the power. He alone is worthy, worthy of all praise. We will sing. And we will sing. And we will sing. And we will sing. So I'll raise my voice to you. I've done all I can do. These mountains will not move. It seems impossible. But at the mention of your name, the ground begins to quake. And these mountains I can't shake, they bow to you. So I will say. Joy with pain has been Even when I'm feeling hollow There's one name that I will sing Jesus Christ, my Lord and Savior The resurrected King And we will praise Him That is what we are reaching for, Father. We are seeking to know you, Jesus. Father, you are what we are seeking this morning. Because your name alone holds all the power, Jesus. And we know you are here. We know that you are moving. We know that you are making a way, Jesus. Where we see a dead end, you see a story, Father, and we will trust you and we will praise you. Who's ready to praise the name of Jesus in this space? Then we're going to lift this. That we see our Father moving, we see him making a way, making changes in our lives, doing what only he can do. 
I see you taking ground. I see you present. Your Miracles, you will do what you said, for you're the same God now as you've always been. Yes, he is. There's a name that levels mountains. Cause our highways through the sea and I've seen its power unravel battles Right in front of me Yes we have There's a faith that stands defiant Sends Goliath to his knees I've seen his praise unravel shackles right off my feet. All right, let's declare this now. Cause that's the power. Cause that's the power of your life. That's the power. of Jesus, yeah. There is no greater power. There's a hope that calls out courage. In the furnace, son of faith. The kind of daring expectation that every day around me is on an yeah. Cause that's the power of your name. Just a mention makes a way. Giants falling, strongholds breaking, there is healing. That's the power that I claim. It's the same. Oh, the grave, there's no power like the mighty name of Jesus. And there's no power like the mighty name of Jesus. Oh. All right, we're going to declare those words again now. Let's just take a moment to make ourselves more aware of the power that is the name of Jesus, that he is making a way, that he is making the giants fall, and the mountains bow, and the seas move. He is taking ground this morning. All right, and I see you taking ground. I see you taking ground. I see you pressing. Your power is dangerous to the enemy's king. You still do miracles. You will do what you said. For you are the same God now as you've always been. Your spirit breaking now. Your kingdom moving in. Your victory claims the ground that the enemy has. You still do miracles, you will do what you said, for you're the same God now as you've always been. Cause that's the power of your name, just a mention makes a way, giants falling, stumbles breaking, there is healing. And that's the power that I claim, it's the same that the grave. There's no power like the mighty name of Jesus. There's no power like 
the mighty name of Jesus. And there's no power like the mighty name of Jesus. And what can wash away my sin? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. What can make me all again? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. What can wash away my sin? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. What can make me all again? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. Nothing but the blood of Jesus. Yeah. Nothing but the blood of Jesus. Amen this morning to that. Heavenly Father, we thank you. God, we thank you that there is victory, that there is promise in your name. Father, we thank you most of all for the reason that we have to gather together, God. The sacrifice of your son. For him paying the debt that we owe. That we might be able to humbly come before you to be in your presence. To be called your sons and your daughters. God, that is the only hope, that is the only reason that we have to gather together. Father, I ask that um, you would help us to to live more and more each day um, resting in your provision. Father, we can know it and and we can can sing it and, and we can read it in your word. But God, for us to live it is something else. Father, I ask that whatever it is that any anyone has brought in with them this morning, um, God, that is, is weighing them down, that is weighing on their mind, God, that is confusing or, or burdensome. God, for whatever hopes, desires, or longings have come in this room this morning, God, for the prayers that have seemed unanswered or just forever away. God, that you would help those words that we say to echo and and resound true. That they would keep our hearts steadfast in seeking you and, and depending on you. Father, that we would not be tempted to try and take things into our own hands, but that we would rest knowing God, that if we, if we've placed our lives in your hands, that, that, that they are secure there. God, if we place our hopes, our dreams, our desires in your hand, they are secure there. God, if we place our, our burdens and, and our worries and the things that we carry in your hands, that, that, they, are, they, that they are secure there. God, that we could learn not just in anticipation of the victory in your name, but because of the victory in your name, we would learn to rest in your name. God, that it would be more than something that we just sing. It would be more than something that we just read, something more than we just know. But God, that we would be able to experience and live in it. God, you would give us this peace that can only come from you, this assurance that can only come from you. 
God, this assurance that is centered in the fact that just as you were faithful to bring about what you promised from the beginning of days through your son, God, you are faithful. You are faithful with your people. You are faithful to continue working. God, that we know that in, in, in ways that are only your own, God, in things that can only be explained as for your honor and for your glory, God, that you are working in each and every single situation through each and every single person. So help us to live in that, Father. To walk in that daily. To live in that promise. Father, I ask that as we dive into your word this morning that these would be your words and not my own. God, that you would speak to us today. Holy Spirit, that you would prepare our hearts and our minds for what it is that you have. That we would hear, we would receive, and we would do. Um, God, we are thankful for your word, for the blessing that it is, the encouragement that it is. So we just ask that you just continue to be with us now as we dive into it. It's in your precious and holy name we pray these things. Amen. Awesome. Well, good morning. Glad that you guys are all here today. Um, if I have not had the chance to meet you yet, um, let me introduce myself. My name is Christian. I have the pri- privilege uh, of serving as the lead pastor here at Axiom Church, and I'm so glad that you are here with us today. Um, if it's your first time, I just want to kind of echo what Megan said and just encourage you to stop by and fill out that connection card. Uh, we would love to get to know you, love to have the chance to, to meet you. Um, and if it's your second time, uh, don't miss out on your, your uh, free gift card to Boomerang. Um, it's awesome coffee, and you will not regret taking the second to fill the card out and, and get that gift card. Um, so we are in week two of a series that we started last week, because that's how it works. You know, you do something one week, and then the next week is two, and then Spoiler alert, next week is week three. So, you know, man, you came to church today and you didn't know you were going to get a high caliber math lesson, did you? So you're welcome. You guys can all go home and impress your parents. You can text them and be like, you know what comes after one? Two. That's right. Um, so, so we are um, continuing our series that we started last week, looking at parables. And so as I said at the beginning last week, um, so when we are trying to explain something to someone that they have never experienced for themselves, what we do is we take something that they do know and we try and relate it as closely as possible to the thing we're trying to describe that they don't know. That this is one of the reasons that Jesus teaches in parables is he's speaking of the kingdom of heaven, which no one has known, no one understands. Jesus is actively revealing what that kingdom looks like and how God is seeking to bring it about. Um, and then he's also talking about the heart of God, the heart of God that, um, that only the Son of God would know as closely and dearly um, as Jesus does. And so he's revealing these things that, that no human being can truly fully understand and, and has ever experienced outside of Jesus. And so what he does is he takes real-world situations, things that they do understand, they do know, um, parables about farmers and, and soil and, and, and fishing and other things that they would, they would hear and they could understand what is kind of at play in the situation in order to teach an underlying reality about either the kingdom of God or the heart of God. So that's one reason. The second reason, like we talked about last week, is, is this is the part of Jesus' ministry where um, Jesus knows that there is a huge crowd of people who are following him, but not all of the crowd is going to stick around for the long haul. That there is going to come a point in time in the near future that that crowd is going to turn on Jesus. And the same crowd that was shouting Hosanna in the streets as Jesus was entering Jerusalem is going to be the same crowd who's calling out for Barabbas and calling to crucify Jesus. And so what we see happening is Jesus teaches parables so that he can continue teaching his followers, those who have faith that he is the Messiah, but that there's not going to be anything that anyone who's following for the wrong reason will gain from his teaching. That it's, it's using to kind of sort through who is following Jesus at this point in time. That those who have faith, that as Scripture says, that they, they will seek and they will find. That, that the truth will be revealed to them. 
Um, and we see many times, including the parable we're going to look at today, where the disciples ask Jesus for him to explain what the parable means. And Jesus explains it to them. He makes it plain. Because we see this as the reality, that he does lay it out and, and is not hidden. But for anyone who's just following to get something, um, or they're following with the intention of trying to find something to blame or condemn about Jesus, that for these individuals, the realities and the truths of the parables are hidden. So these are the two reasons that Jesus begins teaching in parables at this point in time in his ministry. So we looked at a parable last week. Um, we're going to look at another one today. And then next Sunday, we'll wrap up Matthew 13, looking at the last couple of parables in this chapter. Um, something that I want to say here before we get into our passage today. Um, we love to have clear, defined enemies. I think this is one reason that we enjoy um, superhero movies, right? There's a clear hero and a clear villain, right? There's, there's no gray areas in Marvel, right? It's like Captain America's the good guy and, and uh, what's his name? Blue-faced guy. What's his name? Thanos, thank you. Thanos is the villain, right? He wants to wipe out half the population. He's obviously the bad guy. Captain America's the good guy. He's fighting for all the people, all humanity, all people matter right? Um, I enjoy medieval type movies and TV shows. And um, so in all of these, in most of the cases, it's told from the perspective of one side of a conflict. And that side you're told from is always right, right? They're always in the right of way. And so one of the shows I'm watching now um, is it takes place in, in England during the area of the Vikings coming and kind of invading England and England kind of coming together and becoming one country. What's really cool about the show is it shows the perspective of both sides and like the purpose of the conquest of the Vikings, but then also the unification of the country of England. And, and, and what's interesting about this is, is in many of the battles, as they're kind of coming together and fighting, you find yourself as the viewer, you know, kind of torn between both sides because what you realize, what they really do a great job of capturing in the show is the humanity and the complexity to each side. That for both sides, they believe that they are fighting for a just cause. In both cases, they're fighting for their families and to protect their loved ones and to ensure that they have the land and food and provision that they need. They're fighting to avenge lost loved ones or they're fighting to avenge lost brothers in battle. And so on both sides, you see this kind of, this, this difficulty of like, there's not clearly a, a, a right side and a wrong side. You know, in some ways, this side is right. In some ways, this side is right. In some ways, this side is wrong. In some ways, this side is wrong. And I think we can struggle with this reality. We can struggle with this because we want it to be clear. We want it to be defined. We want to have a boogeyman to point to and say, this is, this is the evil. This is the problem. This is what we're fighting against. So I think that what can happen when we talk about passages, and the, the parable we're going to look at today, is it, it, we can, in an effort to try and clarify identify the villain, we can name someone a villain who's not actually a villain. It's really easy in more ways than one, and, and we understand this, I think, more than we have in a long time, at least where we are today, and the divisive nature of humanity, and what happens whenever it becomes an us versus them mentality. That I'm right, they're wrong, what I want to see happen is the very best, and what they want to see happen is wicked and evil and needs to be destroyed and stopped. But all this does is create enemies where I do not believe Scripture sees enemies. And I think that unfortunately, not just in many of the different varying topics that we can divide on is this a reality, but I think that we can even develop this within the church when we talk about those who are found and those who are lost. And if we're not careful that we can develop a superiority complex within ourselves if we have found the saving grace of Jesus for this is those who have not yet. And I don't think that's ever an, an intention or a thought that we say, you know what, I'm better than them. But I do believe that if we misunderstand, if we misread, if we kind of fall back into traditions and some of the ways things have been taught in the past, that this can be our tendency, that this can be the heart that we develop. And I don't believe that this is the heart or falls in line with the heart of Christ. So this is what we're going to look at today. We're going to look at 
the parable of the weeds in Matthew chapter 13. So we're going to start in verse 24. So what it says, says, he put another parable before them, saying, the kingdom of heaven may be compared to a man who sowed good seed in his field. But while this man, while his men were sleeping, his enemy came and sowed weeds among the wheat and went away. So when the plants came up and bore grain, then the weeds appeared also. So there's a master who has a field and he goes out and he sows wheat in his field. And, and, and the parable emphasizes and says, good seed, good seed. What this means is this is not seed that is mixed with weeds, right? Did you know that there is varying levels of quality of seed that you can buy that has certain things in it, other things? So like, so like if you go, go to Home Depot, and you go to buy some grass seed, that there's different types you can buy, right? And depending on the type, they contain different things. And whenever you buy the correct type for your correct type of soil and your correct type of climate, it takes. It's good seed. But if you buy bad seed, then it could take, but a lot of stuff could come up with it. But here we're told it's good seed. It's good seed that the master puts down. Then when his men are asleep, there's an enemy who comes. And the enemy comes and he sows weeds among the wheat. And he does it so that as the wheat is growing, so do the weeds grow up with it. Now, the Greek word used for weeds here, we more than likely believe, was a type of wheat called a darnel. Now, darnel is known by another name, false wheat. The reason it's called false wheat is because as it's growing, this weed and wheat are nearly indistinguishable, indistinguishable from one another. That you cannot look at them and really see the difference. That it's not actually until the wheat is ready to harvest that you can see the difference between the wheat and the weeds. Because as they're growing, they look the same. This would have been a common problem in this area. This would have been a weed that they were very familiar with. Because in some occasions, mistaking the weeds, they would have harvested it thinking it was wheat, used it for the same purpose, and it doesn't work the same. The bread doesn't taste as good. Things don't turn out as well because it's false wheat. It's not real wheat. It's false wheat. But it looks really, really similar. So continuing on in verse 27. <clears throat> it says, And the servants of the master of the house came and said to him, Master, did you not sow good seed in your field? How then does it have weeds? He said to them, An enemy has done this. So the servant said to him, then do you want us to go and gather them? But he said, no, lest in gathering the weeds, you uproot the wheat along with them. So the servants, as they see the wheat and the weeds growing up together, they're like, oh no, this is a serious problem. And they rush to the master because obviously no one has come here intentionally sowing weeds in with the wheat, right? That wasn't an intention thing. That was not intentional. So it must have been something that was done wrong in casting the seeds in the first place. And so they go to the master. Master, did you not put down good seed? The master says, yes, yes, I did. And they say, so why are there all these weeds? If you put down good seed, why are there weeds? And the master knows. Without even knowing what has happened, what has taken place, not having to see the situation unfold, the master knows. An enemy has done this. And the servants say, okay, so if this is an enemy, do you want us to remove it? The master says, no, because I don't want you to pull wheat thinking it's weeds. I don't want you to pull wheat thinking it's weeds. And he closes out the parable in verse 30. He says, let both grow together until the harvest. And at harvest time, I will tell the reapers, gather the weeds first, and bind them in bundles to be burned, but gather the wheat into my barn. The master says, let it grow together. And when the time is right, when the time of harvest comes, you will be able to tell the difference between the wheat and the weeds. And my reapers will gather the wheat together, will be gathered and will be burned, and the wheat will be gathered and put in my barn. 
This is how Jesus closes out the parable. Now, we're going to jump down a little bit further into the passage, and we're going to look at Jesus' explanation, because this is one of the parables where Jesus' disciples come to him and say, explain to us what you're talking about, Jesus. But for most of us in this room, there's a chance that we've heard this passage before, a chance maybe you've heard it preached on before, or you're reading it, and at first glance, it just seems so clear what this passage is talking about. And you're not wrong at first glance. The passage is talking about those who are lost and those who are found. But here's what I'm talking about, that it draws a line that I don't believe is intentionally there that you and I can create. It creates a, I am wheat, they are weeds mentality. I'm good, they're bad. The good gets taken care of, the bad gets taken out, right? It's an easy mentality to build. It's an easy mentality and an easy approach to have that can easily develop the sense of an us versus them. Let's look at how Jesus explains the parable of the weeds, starting in verse 36. It says, Then he left the crowds and went into the house. And his disciples came to him, saying, Explain to us the parable of the weeds of the field. He answered, The one who sows the good seed is the Son of Man. The field is the world, and the good seed is the sons of the kingdom. The weeds are the sons of the evil one. And the enemy who sowed them is the devil. The harvest is the end of the age. And the reapers are angels. So he just breaks it down. He says, this is, this is how it goes. The one who sows the good seed, the master, that is the son of man. This is one of, according to Matthew, one of Jesus' favorite identifiers for himself, that he is the son of man. He's the Messiah. So Jesus says, I am the one who sows the good seed. He says, the field is the world. The good seed are the sons of the kingdom. The bad seed, the weeds, are the sons of the evil one. And the enemy who sows the bad seeds is the devil. This is how he breaks it down. And then he says, the harvest is the end of the age, and the reapers are angels. So this is how he breaks it down. He says, the one who sows the good seed is Jesus. The field is the world. The good seeds are the sons of the kingdom. The weeds are the sons of the evil one. The enemy is the devil, and the reapers are the angels who come at the end of the age to harvest. And he continues explaining in verse 40. Just as the weeds are gathered and burned with fire, so will it be at the end of the age. The Son of Man will send his angels, and they will gather out of his kingdom all causes of sin and all lawbreakers, and throw them into the fiery furnace. In that place there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Then the righteous will shine like the sun in the kingdom of, the, of their Father. He who has ears, let him hear. So Jesus says, just as in the parable, there's going to come a time at the end of the age, the angels are going to be sent out and they're going to gather all the weeds together, all the sons of the evil one, all causes of sin and all lawbreakers. And they will be cast out. In this place, there will be weeping and there will be gnashing of teeth. It's a place of despair. It's a place of separation. It's a place of anger. It's a place of hate. It's a place that is separate from. It's a side of. It's outside of. And he says, and all the wheat will be gathered together. And it'll shine. And when he says shine, it's because it will be in the presence of their father. That will be in the place of glory. It will be in the place where his glory and his presence dwells. So there's truth.